Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Welcome to episode 18 of Words on Whiskey, brought to you by Irish Whiskey Magazine. Uh, a great show lined up, and uh, as usual, we'll start off with the news. And kicking off the news, we have uh, a few new releases and some news out of Rowan Co. So uh, the first news, um, Eccleville Distillery have released uh, the third release of the Palo Cortado a single cast, calf strength, 18 year old single malt. And it's been released this evening, uh, available on their website. Uh, 318 bottles only, and retailing for £199 sterling. And uh, then there's a new brand on the, on the scene now, and these are released, uh, I think, today. And they're distilled by, or sorry, not distilled, they're, they're blended by our previous guest that we had on the show, Dr. Jack O'Shea. And uh, three releases, they're based out of Limerick. Uh, so we've got the Haven, the Journey, and the Horizon. So they're ranging in price from 45, pa- 45 euro up to 68, I think it is. So you've got uh, the Journey, which is a triple cast uh, release. It's in a virgin oak, American bourbon, and then finished in a Jamaican rum cask. And that's at 43% ABV and retailing at 45 euro. You've got the Haven, uh, which is a triple distilled pot still, uh, finished in or matured in bourbon and Oloroso casks. Again, 43% ABV and uh, 58 euro for that. And then finally, you have the Horizon, which is a 10 year old blend. Uh, in, finished in uh, American bourbon and finished in Barbados rum casks, 43% ABV and 65 euros. So Jack O'Shea is the blender behind that, and the founder is Keen Quilty. And uh, then in, uh, I guess, an act of unity, uh, Rowan Co. Distillery have opened up their cocktail garden to uh, some businesses. So they're... Uh, Open now, so here you see Niall Satago of Salty Boy and uh, Niall Satago from Salty Boy and we have Keelan Higgs from Variety Jones. They've also a feature where the um, Guinness Garden is also open and you can take away uh, canned some of their products there. So in terms of news, I suppose fairly quiet, fairly quiet. The the pubs are still in lockdown, unfortunately, and... uh, in Dublin anyway, and there are signs that that may spread elsewhere. So our thoughts are, of course, with all the, the workers in the hospitality to trade and wish them all the very best. So you're all very welcome to the show. Um, thank you for coming. If you enjoy the show, please do subscribe to our, our channel. And um, as you know, our guests today, I'm really excited. I'm very envious of the role that uh, they have, um, if it was a dream job to pick, I think uh, this person would have our the role that I would really love to have. But uh, saying that, let's just bring in Carol Quinn. Carol, good evening. Good evening, Sergius. Thank you very Our, much for inviting me on. Oh, thank you very much for giving us the honour of joining us. So, uh, official title, Head of Archives at Middleton Distillery. <laughs> Head of archives. <laughs> and I think you're right, to be honest. I don't think it gets much better than that. It's pretty much my dream job as well. So you're going to have to fight me, Sergio. Uh, no competition. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think there's anybody that could do the job better, Carl. Uh, Thank you. Tell me, how did you start to become an archivist? So you're originally from Cork, I presume. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Cork, yeah. So you would never venture out of Cork, out of the Republic of Cork and... Uh, so just why would I? Absolutely, am. <laughs> why would I? Um, <laughs> no, I, I'm actually that's that Cork cliche. Um, born in Cork, went to university in Cork, and work in Cork. You know, okay, <laughs> it's okay. kind of, it's kind of tragic <laughs> in one way. But uh, there yeah. were there were bits when I was outside of Cork for a while. But yeah. um, I went to UCC, and it'll come as no shock to anybody that I, I did history and archaeology there. Um, right. I always enjoyed. I enjoyed the past. I enjoyed reading about the past. I, I never found studying to be any sort of work. You know, I had yeah. friends who were doing commerce and science and they, to me, they seemed to have to work, whereas I just got to read, <laughs> you know, okay. so I thought that was pretty cool. But when I finished, um, I knew I wanted, 
that was the area that was of interest to me. But I also wanted to be employable. Uh, so I didn't want to go down the road of doing an MA in medieval history and then being pretty much unemployable. This was back kind of in the 90s. And I know you'll remember it, Sergio. This was not a time when there was a lot of jobs knocking around for people. So I, I wanted a vocational um, qualification. So I went up to the career service on College Road in UCC and they had all these binders, you know, alphabetical of, of careers and how you go about them. Yeah. And I took down the first one, which was A, <laughs> and I saw Arcus, and uh, I thought, oh, that suits. So I applied to UCD, and there's a master's in archive administration there. They're the only college in Ireland that offers it. But for anybody out there interested, uh, there's a lot of online courses now, the University of Dundee in particular, and I think Liverpool and maybe University of London, but Dundee is, is one that if you wanted to do it by distance learning, so it's it's a recognized qualification. And um, sometimes you'll see people with the job title archivist, but they haven't actually got the qualification. And it's something that I, I just watch out for because there are a lot of skills that you learn. Yeah. And it's not just in the handling of the material and, and the physical, um, the curatorial aspect to it, but it's in, in the management of information because that's basically at the core of what an archivist does. Yeah. You, you manage information and you're a conduit for uh, almost distilling out that information and sharing it. So you physically look after the records of the past. And what archives are is something that it's created in the normal day to day activity of either a person or a business. Uh, for yourself, it might be your own notebooks it might be letters. These days, of course, it's emails and texts. And for businesses, um, including distilleries, it would be employee ledgers, it would be uh, distillation records, correspondence with suppliers, uh, customers, all of which are created not with an idea that a historian is going to want to look at them, um, but they're created for the normal day-to-day -day business, but we preserve them because of the unique information that they have. And part of your role and part of the skill as an archivist is actually choosing what you preserve because you simply can't preserve everything. You know, um, that's something that is true. There are some documents that uh, don't warrant preservation. They, mm -hmm. they don't have the information and that is part of the skill that you learn. So yeah. um, I would say anybody who is interested in it as a career, uh, take the time out to, to actually get the qualification. Yeah, I mean, is there a time limit? Like, could you say you're an archivist for records that are only 10 years old? You, you certainly could, and yeah. there are a lot. Um, I was at a conference last year when we could travel. You might remember travel, Sergio. Yes. And yeah. I was in San Francisco, and I was lucky enough to meet uh, the archivist at Facebook. Right. And uh, I don't think there's a single piece of paper in their archive. No. Um, but they're literally archiving history as it happens. Yeah. So I don't think you need to be as old and as venerable as, as some of the companies that form Irish distillers. And certainly to any of the new entrants on the scene um, in the Irish whiskey scene, I'd say have an eye to, to your own history and your heritage. You know, just just keep maybe put away a few things, maybe note a few crucial dates, um, take photographs, print them out, yeah, and uh, write on the back of them who's in the photograph. That's, I mean, is that one of the challenges that so much of the information now? I mean, there's been more information created in the last year than possibly in the last ever. It absolutely. Um, in terms of every form as well, because of course archives don't just have to be paper. Uh, yes. Traditionally, that's what they were because that's what people used. But um, photographs, um, artworks, uh, posters, and of course for me, bottles are an yeah. extremely important part. And like I remember when I'd come home from my holidays, you know, as, as in your early twenties, and you'd be wandering off. The first thing you just rush the chemist with the roll of film. Because you yes, only had yeah. 12, 24 or 36. So you, you chose your, your photos and you got them printed out as soon as you could. Nowadays, you know, I, I take 300 on a weekend and scroll through my phone, deleting as I go. So there, there is there is going to be an information gap and there are digital archivists and it is a skill. It's yeah. a skill I wrestle with because, of course, part of my remit is also um, to preserve our, our digital output in terms of our websites as well okay. because there's a lot of brand information held there so uh that isn't an area i'm 100 percent easy in but there is a great network in ireland of archivists 
So I contacted colleagues in the National Library um, who are doing a fantastic job in uh, archiving websites for Ireland and they gave me great pointers and, you know, so, so, so I'm, I'm engaging with uh... Even archiving websites is part of the role of an archivist Absolutely. these days. It's, it's information. It's yeah. whatever form the information is is found in. Wow. Yeah. So you mentioned you were you went to UCD. I did. You, and you studied there. And um, from there, how did you find yourself in Irish distillers? Uh, a long road. <laughs> <laughs> um, after UCD, I'd had enough of studying. Um, because I, I was born one of those children who go to school very early. So I had, I had my postgrad done by the time I was 21. Wow. You know, I, I was well finished. So um, I, I wanted to um, kick my heels up for a little bit. So I did. And then part of my degree was archaeology. So I worked as an archaeologist for a while. But then I got back into archives working in the Cork Archives Institute. And then um, I was archivist in the Bull Library in UCC for 16 years, actually. Right. And it was there that uh, Irish distillers approached UCC looking for guidance, really. Um, it was Peter Moorhead at the time. He was our head of production. Yes. And it was uh, back kind of 2013, a time of great expansion for Irish distillers when um, the new Garden Still House was being launched. Plans for the micro distillery were there. And Peter really, he was quite a visionary, uh, wanted our history to be part of that transformation and part of that future. So all the records were there, but they just didn't know how to look after them. So they turned to UCC, where happily I was working, yeah. and the rest yeah. is history. You very quickly went over the knocking around part before you started uh, work. What did you oh, do? Yeah. Were you traveling? Were you chilling? Oh, or? A part of it was, and I must say, I always say one of the best jobs I ever had. Um, I did bar work for a time and loved it. Right. I worked in a very iconic bar in Cork, Cork of course it was Cork, yes. uh, the High B Bar. Um, right. If anybody is from Cork, they'd know as well. Very good. And um, did you have a, a a liking for whiskey at the time, or was it a no. premature thing? <laughs> oh, no. um, I didn't, because at the time when, when I was um, socialising in my twenties and early thirties. Whiskey wasn't wasn't the popular drink that, that it is now, and it certainly wasn't a drink that my friends were, were drinking out socially. Yeah. Um, it was something that I, I came to when I joined Irish Distillers, and like, like everyone else, I would have had the occasional hot whiskey come winter. But yeah. um, my first, I started in September, so it was a kind of whirlwind few months, and very soon we were into December, and that was Christmas party season. So I was going to my first Christmas party and that was the year that uh, Barry Crockett was going to retire, you know, um, the year coming. And at the party, I was actually sitting next to Barry because he's a huge history buff and we always have great chats. And uh, so there was going to be a toast to Barry because this was his last Christmas party. So my, <laughs> my first glass of whiskey was well, Barry Crockett Legacy sitting next to Barry. So. Oh my, yeah, it doesn't get much better than that, does no, it? No, no, it doesn't, no. Not one you'd... So you're with, well, you're with IDL now eight years, is it? Yep, yeah, yeah. yeah. So give us an indication of, of the kind of volume that you have to deal with. Well, th that was the first thing I had to do was bring together the archival collection of IDL. Yeah. IDL, as, as most people know, was formed in uh, the 1960s. It was a merger of three classic, um, just, oh, there's me. That's there's me you. at work. Uh, that's strong room number five. And that's me just showing some of the records. And yeah. one of the first things we had to do was bring together the records of the firms, John Jameson and Son, John Power and Son, and the Cork Distilleries Company, who were the three oh, yeah. companies that merged to form Irish Distillers. And that's the actual original merger document. Is it? And okay. yeah, it is. Wow. In fact, it is. Yeah. And the records, when the companies were formed, um, production was transferred in 1975 down to New Middleton. And the Dublin distilleries were closed at that time because they were no longer fit for purpose. They yeah. were Victorian buildings. And they had both, Bow Street, uh, the home of Jameson, and John's Lane, the home of Powers had been built originally at the edge of Dublin city, but the city had, had swallowed them up and, and had surrounded them. So that was fine when everything came in and out on horse and cart. But if you're trying to get a tanker up Bow Street now, uh, good luck. 
So uh, when they merged, in these buildings were all the historical records. And at the time, even though that they knew they had to leave the buildings behind, they were not willing to dispose of or get rid of the archives. So they got assistance from the National Archives in Ireland in preserving them until they had such um, a premises to bring them to. And that was my first role, was actually helping to physically build an archive and then to uh, bring back the records and join the collection together as a whole. And what that entailed was me using one of the grain stores in our brand home, uh, the Jameson Distillery in Middleton, uh, donning a blue coat. And we, we had some helpers in with us and actually dusting down every single record. And there was a lot, a lot of dust. Looking at the records, um, doing a very, very brief overview of them, an Excel spreadsheet, really, and just working out what they were, uh, what was duplicated and what needed permanent preservation, and then transferring them over to the distiller's cottage where we had built a purpose-built archival repository. So yeah. it's got five strong rooms. Um, you had That's where I was in the photo you were showing there, me with the shelves. Five strong rooms, all temperature controlled, humidity controlled. They're built into National Museum standard. And that's where the records stay now. And my primary job is the physical uh, custody of those records. Yeah, what kind of volume are you talking about, Carol? I get the impression like there's crate loads and crate loads of uh, archives. They um, they are. We usually do it by by shelf or by meterage. Um, we we've hundreds of meters of records. We we really do. Right. And uh, part of my role as I was going through it was actually sharing what I found and. This is with a group of visitors to Middleton, um, to the distiller's cottage. And I think they were here to learn more about the history of Jameson. And rather than just hear it, it's very nice to actually see it. Where do I get the information from? Now, because yeah. all archives are totally unique and, and irreplaceable, there isn't a second copy of anything. Nothing leaves the distiller's cottage. And right. it's not open for visitors in the way that, you know, maybe a museum or a library is because even the handling of these documents will cause them to deteriorate. So right. they're only brought out of storage for very, very particular occasions. And if any point, I think that they're bringing them out and laying them out, as you see here, um, for any archive fans out there, they're actually sitting on what are known as archive cushions, which give support to the spines. I use a plastic called mylar, and so any photographic material goes into that. If I thought anything was being damaged by the showing, then it doesn't come out again. Yeah, I mean, Until are, are they repaired. damaged? Is it possible they're damaged by flash even? Or are they that sensitive to light? They, no, no. Um, you, there's UV filters on our windows and on our lights. Um, and you, you will read and you will go to some places and they won't allow flash photography. But yeah. if you saw where these records had been, like some of them, <laughs> yeah. you know, stuck under a still, I, I think the odd little blast of, of, um, of a camera isn't going to do them that much damage but we do on our all our own lighting we do have uv filters yeah i mean obviously this is a great archive and a great resource for the brands that they represent uh, yeah. and you know you don't have to conjure or make up any kind of stories the stories are there the history is, is real and tangible uh, how much importance is placed upon the archives um Absolutely, absolutely huge. And yeah. that, that was really important for me in that um, I didn't want to be, um, I'm, go I'm going to say just glossy lip service. You know, I, I had I had a career in archives. I, I feel I had a very strong reputation as an archivist. I wasn't going anywhere that uh, the collection wasn't going to be looked after properly and standards were going to be maintained. And yeah. Irish distillers just embraced that. I mean, they invested heavily in building the physical infrastructure, in bringing me in. I mean, they could easily have given the job to somebody internally and said, OK, you mind the old stuff. But they yeah. didn't. You know, they actually looked for somebody whose specialism was looking after this. And uh, I'd have to say it's, it's they love their history. You know, yeah. that's why that's why they do it. And everyone in the company takes great pride um, in our history. We have a, an intranet uh, in our spirit that, you know, the usual news goes up and everything. And every now and then I write a little piece just highlighting something that I've come across that's of interest. And the reaction is always fantastic all across the company. You know, I get messages from the bottling plant everywhere. Yeah, I mean, a lot of that news kind of 
is internal, I suppose, but a lot of it gets externally shared as well. And I know, I know you're very, you're very, very good at giving that information as well. You're always sending me little trippets, which I love to <laughs> love to read. But uh, well, it's, there... it's lovely to talk to people who enjoy the history of Irish whiskey, and it's one of the things that that sets Irish whiskey apart as a truly great drink is this incredible history and legacy. And I, yeah. I think when I started the job, that's the thing that that knocked me for six, really, and, and just um, I hadn't been expecting was when I looked through the records and I saw what a global drink it was. You know, in the 1870s, 1880s, 1900s, th there was no part of the world that you couldn't get Irish whiskey and that it wasn't held in great esteem. I think this is what really astonished me yeah. was um, the reputation it had back then. If I'm trying to think now of, of something from Ireland, that was regarded as such a prestige and such a luxury item, maybe Waterford Crystal or, or, or probably Butter, you know, a really, really good yeah. product that it's that's recognized all over the world. But in the yeah. 1880s and 1890s, Irish whiskey was a byword for luxury yeah. and premiumis premiumization, which yeah. isn't something that um, I expected. Yeah, but I mean, it's so inextricably linked with Irish history. Uh, Absolutely. The story of yeah. Irish with you and Irish history, they're so inextricably linked. And I'm sure you get a fascinating insight into life as it was in the last couple of hundred years. I mean, what are some of your most interesting tricks? Or, you know, overall, I suppose, looking back, how does it feel to be looking back at some of those uh, lifestyles, if you like, that people would have had back then? It, it's absolutely fascinating. And a lot of people would have asked me, you know, did I know a lot about this area of history before I took the job? And I didn't. So I was discovering every single day. But when I first started um, in Irish distillers, it coincided with um, our master distiller, Barry Crockett, retiring. And Barry, as I mentioned, is a huge history buff. And he volunteered with me for three years, uh, helping me going through the records. So um, we had desks kind of uh, adjacent to each other. And he, he wouldn't pop in all day, every day, but he'd come in two or three days a week. Okay. And he he indexed a lot of the old minute books for me. And as I was going through the records and learning, I was yeah. able to ask Barry because he had grown up under the old system, under the, the distillery run under the 1880 Spirits Act. That was that was the system that his father, Max Crockett, who'd been the distiller before him, knew. Yeah. So when I would take out these old distillation records, nowadays, of course, it, it's all um, it's all a computer program. And these old ledgers, it was like watching time go back it was like watching barry lift the veil up and look at them and he had to concentrate and then you just saw the understanding and he was able to explain to me then what what all these records were so that was a really fantastic introduction and then through those records understanding the lives yeah. and th there are stories some some of the um records can look quite dull you know but when you delve into them i was looking through one of the distillery ledgers from uh, Bow Street, uh, from the Jameson distillery from the 1880s. And it's kept by the head distiller and uh, he needs to keep it for two reasons. He needs to keep it because Inland Revenue want to know exactly how much he's distilling, but he's also keeping it because he's learning, you know, and this is something that I saw through the records that none of these distillers who were making a product that was world renowned ever thought they knew it all. They never did, you know, uh, they were always open to more learning. So in a little little comment section, he would add in little notes. And there was one, there was a whole paragraph, which was unusual. And they're going through and there's been an awful mess made. Um, I think I think the year was 1886. And basically uh, a young man called Bill Scully had got promoted. And because we have the full collection, I had the wage books as well as the distillery ledgers. Yeah. And I saw he'd been working in the brew house and he had got promoted up into the um, still house, which is where you want to be, really. Yeah. And um, as you know, um, most Irish whiskey is triple distilled. And what this poor guy tried to do was fill the middle still before it had been emptied. So he's trying to fill a yeah. full still. So he Ooh. ruins two batches. Yeah. And Jameson, for them, quality was everything. So they could have siphoned it off, redistilled it, but they didn't. You know, they got rid of it because... They just said, this is a mess up. And it was written there in, in ink, Scully was to blame. And your heart yeah. stops. And you immediately, I mean, you're there. You're there. You're in his shoes. And you're going, oh, my God, that poor guy. 
and you can just feel his shoulders going down and the head hanging and everything like this. Um, yeah. And he, because we had the full records, I was able to check up. A lot of the older guys, two of them that week were out sick and he oh, was no. left in charge. So what happened to him, you know, just in case the electricity goes and people are left hanging, Sergius, yeah. uh, he, he wasn't fired. <laughs> He was put back into the brew house where he'd been happy and he had 40 long happy years with the company. Oh but God. such a human story. Can you imagine it? And can you imagine the slagging for the rest of his life? You know, Well, these are the kind of stories that I, I think, you know, you don't come across in any history books. You're not going to come across those kind of stories or the lifestyle. Um, they're not particularly significant in, in themselves, but they're very human stories and they're very real and really give you an insight into they're extremely how human life and, was. And, and that, that's really what you want. You yeah. know, that's what you want to hear. There's another story I absolutely love um, in Bow Street in Jameson and uh, conditions were, you know, rough enough for, yeah. for everyone, which, which was common at the time for the employees there. And they had a, you know, small little tea room that had a little gas cooker and um, a kettle that served as a teapot as well, really, on it. Yeah. And every now and then, uh, this little caboose would be raided by management looking for pilfered whiskey, you know, because they knew it was in there somewhere, but they never had it. And I was talking to a guy who retired out of Bow Street, and he was telling me that on your first day, you'd be taken aside and you'd be told, never, ever light the gas under that kettle because that's where they kept the spirit that they were after siphoning out of the barrel. And so you go in for your cup of tea and you'd have a little nip and then you'd head out again. And you can just imagine how you'd feel like, hee hee hee, you know, you're getting uh, this illicit drop. And it's those stories that I think are, are just lovely. And they show you maybe the atmosphere of a workplace, which is what you want to know. Do people like going in there? Is it somewhere yeah. you wanted to be employed? Yeah, I mean, uh... Some of the archives um, are very powers related. Others are Jameson related. Others are. Yeah. Are, are there records from from all three brands? In, there are in your archives. Yeah. yeah. Um, the two Dublin distilleries, as I mentioned, uh, the National Archives was able to step in and help uh, preserve them. And for Cork, uh, the records of the Cork Distillery Company, uh, the Cork City and County Archive um, also helped in, in a similar way. So we do, and that's something that increasingly um, I'm looking at those records. I had to prioritize, and so I, I kind of focused very much on Jameson to begin with and Powers, and I'm kind of looking now more at the records from Cork and from the Murphy family, who were the founders of Middleton Distillery. And they're astonishing, and you really don't find them in any of the history books. And what they did is, was absolutely incredible. I have records as well, they were a Catholic family to, to go back to the start. And in the 18th century, they made their money through tanning, uh, providing hides for leather workers. There were very few areas open um, in trade for Catholics. And this is where they made their money. And from that, they branched out into other mercantile activities and including tea importation. They were very, very big tea importers. And we have ledgers um, from their ships that they owned. Their family home was on Morrison's Island, which if you know Cork City, it's right in the centre near the Holy Trinity, it's near RTE Cork. And they would send schooners from Morrison's Island, from literally their front door in the 1830s, directly to China. They were trading directly with China. And those schooners would come back up the River Lee, they would dock on Morrison's Island, and the bales of aromatic tea would be unloaded on the keys there. And we have lists of all the different varieties, you know, names I'd never heard of, Campo, Bohoi, um, Twanky is another variety of the tea, and Pico. And it to me, it was just incredible that they were traversing the oceans like that, that they were dealing with a country so far away with different cultures and bringing that back to Cork which was actually quite a sophisticated place at the time. And so they were people with a world vision. Yeah. And while the tea trade was very, very good to them, there, there is, of course, the occasional sinking of a ship, which yeah. doesn't do anyone any good. And they wanted to invest their money into an industry or a business that was going to last through the generations. And for them, it was going to be distilling and making whiskey. And so in 1825, they purchased the site 
in Middleton. It was a former woolen mill and they converted it and they sent a number of the family out to live on the site in the distiller's cottage and learn distilling from the ground up. And that became the tradition with the Murphy family right up until the 1970s. It didn't matter that you were destined to be the CEO or the managing director. You started by pushing a broom and cleaning the floor of the still house. So they understood distilling inside out. So no distiller could ever come to them and uh, try and blind them with jargon because they knew it. You know, they were really, really hands on. And they're somebody and a family, I think, that we can be intensely proud of. And I'm dying to share more about them because I, I think they're unsung heroes of Irish whiskey making. Yeah, in, in terms of volumes and quality of uh, archives, who who kept the best records? It's not a competition, Sergio. Yeah. But they were really competitive <laughs> companies. I mean, okay, uh, they did merge. They, but, uh, they 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 were they were really com they were competitive, and they kept an eye on each other. Uh, when you look through the minutes of the Cork Distilleries Company, you know they keep an eye on what Jameson is selling its whiskey for in Dublin. What is the opening price for Powers? Yeah. But what comes through all the records, through the three companies, and this is well before, you know, they even ever thought of merging, was, was collaboration. They did collaborate together for the good of the industry. If they ever felt their industry was under threat or that there was something coming down the line um, yeah. that they should uh, face together, they did work together. And that's yeah. something that is really heartening, this, this whole history of collaboration. And you still see it today. and. One example from the archives is 1916, um, the First World War. There was a movement by the government, the British government at the time, to nationalise all the distilleries and turn them into munition factories. Okay. So the distillers knew that they needed to act as one. They needed to speak with one voice. So they all came together to form the Irish Pot Still Distillers Association. And it was chaired in the first entrance by Andrew Jemison and uh, deputy chairman was uh, Sir Thomas Talbot Power and members of the Murphy family were on the board there. So they came, they had no problem coming together and speaking with a united voice. And they had no problem in supporting each other, which I think is something that is true today as well. There's an awful lot of collaboration and sharing and working together, which is good. It's a really, yeah. really good thing. And tell me, how, how did they view the Scotch industry back then? Uh, how, how big were they as rivals? Uh, what comes through the archive is there is no mention of Scotch whatsoever. Really? Uh, they weren't keeping an eye on Scotland. Uh, they weren't interested. Um, they would not have seen themselves as rivals. They would have seen themselves as an entirely different and separate and perhaps superior right. drink. Um, yeah. No, they didn't. They, uh, they, they weren't looking over there. They concentrated on what they were doing and what they were doing well. That was their focus. It, you know, they weren't interested in comparing themselves, really. Yeah. If you look at the Dublin, and we'll talk about the Dublin uh, distilleries just for a minute. Obviously, we talk about the Golden Triangle mm -hmm. in Dublin, and we talk about the Liberties. Yeah. Uh, what kind of insight did you get into to life in the Liberties at that time? And why was it that distilleries really took such a hold in that area? Um, I love going through the liberties, I have to say. Um, when I travel up to Dublin, I usually come in through Houston Station and I'll yeah. walk wherever I'm going simply so that I can walk down Thomas Street and I can go by John's Lane and I, I can, you know, walk that area, as you so rightly say, the Golden Triangle. Um, why it's it, so many distilleries and breweries were up there, um, you had very good water sources. You get uh, water from the River Vartry coming in. Uh, they, it's not Liffey water that they're using. And you're also near um, the barley fields outside in County Dublin, and you're near the main artery out of Dublin, as well as being near the river. So you have your international trade and you have your domestic trade. It was actually a, a perfect spot because, of course, the liberties were outside of the city walls in Dublin. And I think that's as good a time as any to show you what I'm drinking tonight. Well, we're I'm going to join you. You, you told me it was appropriate to have a Toscan, and yeah. I thought what I would treat myself to is a glass of, this is Powers uh, 1817, and this is a 10-year-old whiskey, and it was specially bottled for the LVA, for the Licensed Vintners Association, who represent the Dublin pubs. And 
they're in lockdown, as you mentioned at the beginning this evening. Yeah. So I'd just like to raise a glass to the licensed witness. And as I talk about the history of the liberties, you have to remember that James Power, the founder of Powers, was himself um, a publican. And that's why the, the LVA went with Powers for their anniversary bottling. So I'm well, going I to salute think, uh, a John's to, lane to the pub. Excellent. The pub. And we hope, um, we hope that uh, we'll be sitting in them in mm. Dublin very soon. Yeah. I mean, personally, how has the, um, the lockdown affected you, the COVID? You're not going into the on-site at the moment, are you? I, I travel in once a week um, to physically inspect the building um, so, because that's important to me. And there is a, a caretaking team in um, Middleton as well. But as you can see from my backdrop, <laughs> I'm not in my office. Yeah. So I've been working at home from March because obviously anybody who could work at home was asked to do so. And I, if you'd asked me a year ago, could an archivist work from home? I would have said no. I would have said very clearly, you must be with your collection and you yeah. cannot. Um, but then when you're forced to, when you have to, uh, you, you learn new tricks, Sergius. Um, yes. I would say I'm doing about 80 to 85 percent of my normal duties, um, which are uh, sharing information. Yesterday, yeah. I spent taking part in a workshop with Jameson. Um, just again, doing another deep dive into our history and, and seeing what inspiration that would spur on for some maybe new new products. So uh, technology has really enabled this. So I'm working from home and um, I do go in once a week. And I must say, I, I enjoy I enjoy that going in and just looking at everything. Yeah, I have to say, do you, do you think of these as your as your children? No. <laughs> I know the difference. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't, and I think that's the, that's the professional thing as well. Very yeah. often, um, I will get a call from members of the families. I, as you have James Power there, I did yes. a lot of work with um, members of the O'Reilly family last year. Charles O'Reilly, in particular, who is a direct descendant of James Power, and his father Frank O'Reilly was the last managing director of Powers, and Charles had a lot of. Um, records in his home and he very kindly contacted me and said if there's some relating to the distillery you know to take them to join the archive in Middleton so when I'd go to Charles's home and he'd open these boxes Charles would get lost you know he'd, right. he'd pick out a document and he'd start reading whereas I would have professional training and I'm going I have an hour for this you know and I would be able to collate work it out go through it so I approach it in a very technical and a very professional manner um, I, if I gave myself the luxury, Sergius, of falling in love with the particular documents, I'd never get my work done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, is it easy to separate your work from the stories that you read about? I mean, some of them are probably heartbreaking. Some of them are very human stories. Some of them are very uplifting, I'm sure. The, the, the vast majority are uplifting every now and then one one gets you and um like i do the i do a lot of work um in terms of of genealogy if somebody feels that you know an ancestor worked and or knows that they did work actually it's a lot easier yeah. for me then yeah. i look up the records and try and share whatever we had and a few years ago i got a phone call from a woman um who'd spent her childhood in dublin her grandfather um, had worked in Bow Street and he was a clerk in the spirit store and her uh, her own father had died so her mother went back to live with with her father so this woman um, grew up around Bow Street and her grandfather uh, he used to come home every day and he would bring a stave from one of the sherry butts in the distillery and he, the two little girls would use this as a seesaw oh, you know and I, th yeah. I thought that was lovely and she was telling me more about her grandfather wh whose name was leach and even though he was a clerk in the spirit store he absolutely loved animals and whenever he'd have a break he'd go down to the stables in bow street and he'd meet the horses scratch the nose he'd bring them an apple he'd bring them a carrot and he would collect some of the hair you often would make brushes out of a horse hair and he would do that and when he died, he'd worked an incredible, something like 53 years in Bow Street. And when he died, the funeral cortege was brought to the gates of Bow Street and the horses were brought out of the stables to say goodbye to their old friend. And I, I, you know, I just, I had to go away, have a cup of coffee at the end of that one. I thought it was such a beautiful 
story and such a beautiful connection. Yeah. And and as you say, it's human beings, Sergius. You yeah. know, um, they might have lived 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 150 years ago. They're still people with the same range of emotions, the same hopes, the same dreams, um, the same wants and desires. And uh, you have to respect that these are their stories. Yeah. And that's one thing, you know, that I, I like. I like all these stories to be treated with a certain amount of respect because it is it is about people and you have their families, their descendants sure. um, still alive. Yeah. I mean, I think we like to think we're so more so much more sophisticated and advanced than people 200 years ago. But the basic human instinct is, is still there. You know, it, and it and the basic really the basic need um, for companionship, for conviviality, you know. Yeah. And maybe to to enjoy a few jokes at work, and you know it's it's still there. Yeah, tell me, Carol. Obviously, there's a lot of talk lately about women in the industry. And, yeah, and you know we've had um, the eruptions recently over Jim Murray's comments in the Bible. And uh, firstly, have you any comments on, about that? What what are your feelings about that? And have you seen that in your work at all? Or has it ever been an obstacle to your work? Um. What I would say, and for anyone who doesn't know, this this was a row about uh, the use of sexist language to describe whiskey, and the use of that language um, is very unpleasant to be around, and it might be a reason why more women aren't working in this area, because they don't want to be around people who do use that language. It's not something that makes you feel safe. It's not something that makes you you feel valued. But again, if I pull things back, you know, historically, why did, do you not see more women in whiskey or in the distilling world? You, you, have to, you have to pull it out. It's nothing to do with whiskey or distilling. This is societal. This is wider than any one industry. And if you hark back to the golden age of Irish whiskey, the 1870s and the 1880s, if you're a woman in 1870, you cannot own property in your own name. As soon as you marry, your husband owns whatever you have. So that means if you own a distillery or a premises, uh, by virtue of your marriage, he will own it. He will make the decisions. He has your money. If you're a writer or an author, he has your copyrights. The minute you marry, you cease to exist in law. Now, that didn't change until 1882. And uh, this is an interesting one for you. Um, it wasn't until 1975. Sergius, that it's legal for a married woman to have a separate bank account to her husband. Yes, and no, up, until, up until 1980, if a woman goes for a bank loan, she needed a male guarantor, whether her father or her husband or the bank manager is perfectly entitled to turn her down. And what happens with all of that is that you have all these barriers to women operating in business. Mm. And so you don't see them. So, um, and when you don't see them, uh, you begin to think, well, they, they mustn't even want to be there. You don't start thinking why they're not there. You just say, well, they possibly prefer not being there and sure, isn't it grand? And you have generations of business people who are uncomfortable dealing with women. They're looking for the person behind the woman who's going to make the decisions. And this adds more and more and more to exclusion. And so in the distilling world, uh, and the ground level, it was very physical work. So you tended to have more males involved. At the managerial, the ownership level, you had women excluded by virtue of there being women. Society was not giving them the apparatus. They couldn't go in. They couldn't open bank accounts. They couldn't deal with getting loans. Uh, business people, uh, grain merchants wouldn't even speak to them. They would wait for the male to come in. So you had them being excluded for all these societal reasons. And one of the great strengths, really, of, of Irish distillers as, as a company has been that um, it is a great place to work if you have potential. It will allow you to, um, to grow and develop and rise up. And an example of that is my own boss that I report into, Tommy Keane, who's head of production. Mm -hmm. He started out as a temporary electrician, but because he had great ability and potential, he rose up. But if you haven't seeded women, they're not going to rise up. And when you look at, in, in more recent times, why they weren't there, the school I went to, um, I didn't do any science subjects because it wasn't thought a girl would need science. 
I have a colleague who was the first bond supervisor appointed in Irish distillers, um, Claire Rose. She was appointed well over 10 years ago and she'd be a lot younger than me and she went to the same school. And the career guidance was she could become a nurse and there was nothing else. But Claire wanted to do engineering. Her father was an electrician. She understood this. She wanted to do it. But because of the school she went to, she wasn't taught mechanical drawing. So when she went to college to do engineering, she's already on the back foot. So when you're making your choices, it, it, it's, it's been stacked against you from secondary school onwards. Mm -hmm. But where Irish Distillers has been incredibly proactive now in tackling this is through our graduate engineering program. Yeah. And we have just seen uh, year after year, fantastic young women coming in through that program who by virtue of their own ability and, and their own prowess have been employed within the company. I'm thinking yeah. of, of people like um, Deirdre O'Carroll, who was one of the first uh, graduates and she's now a bond supervisor along with Claire. Karen Cotter, who was yeah. the first distiller in our micro distillery. In fact, I think two out of three of the distillers there have all been female. Uh, and yeah. there's Julie O'Driscoll in the bond as well, Catherine Condon currently. And because these young women are in there now, they're going to rise yeah. and they're, they're going to go into more positions of authority and they will be role models for other younger women and girls to see that you can go into there. Because even 20 years ago, if you're looking at a blank, an engineering class that's almost, full, almost fully male, that's not yeah. welcoming. That's no. really not welcoming. And yeah. so, so that's with Irish distilling and that's how we're tackling the lack of women in the workforce. But in, in terms of the sexism that, that we started off talking there, I think what I'd like to say to people about that is have a conversation with the women in your life. Um, just turn around to, to work colleagues, to maybe you flat share, maybe you have a partner and just say, you know, have there been times in your working life when you've been made to feel uncomfortable and what was that like and why? because I think it will come as a shock to a lot of people of how much the sexism is in everyday life. Certainly, Sergius, when we did our technical run through this morning, we were talking yeah. about if you're away for work and you're staying overnight in a hotel, yeah. um, ju just ask women, what's that like? I know certainly for myself, there's been many occasions, not my current role, but many occasions through my working career, you pull furniture, O um, over the door or you put a bag inside the door so if the door is open during the night the person's going to fall over them that's yeah. the normal experience for women I don't think men have that experience so I think what I would say is talk to the women in your life find out how have they been made fe feel uncomfortable and then maybe reflect on how we can avoid this sort of behavior for the future yeah Shocking stuff, really. I mean, I mean, you really opened my eyes when you told me that story earlier today. Uh, you know, that really hit home. But I will say that it's amazing. Like one of our most popular posts, I think, ever was when Karen became the distiller in the yeah. micro distillery. It just goes to show that there's an awful lot of women that resonate with those stories. Uh, and hopefully she's an encouragement. And, and the likes of yourself are an encouragement to other people. Other women absolutely to get into the industry, so. absolutely and I, I would say you know in in terms of the whiskey industry go for it you know absolutely yeah. go for it but um th this is bigger than the whiskey and that's something yeah. that i always try and get across even when you're talking about the distilleries historically they're never anything that stands alone you know they're part of the communities they're very much part of the communities um bow street the, we have a certain amount of files there and uh, they're charitable donations. I have ledger yeah. after ledger after ledger. I don't think there was a school in the north side of Dublin that they didn't support somehow. Yeah. And John's Lane is, is absolutely mind-blowing. I have boxes of the letters in. I don't think there was a, a nurse's dance or a hospital fundraiser for 50 yeah. or 60 years that you know a case of gold label wasn't sent down to. Um, but they would sponsor things that you wouldn't expect, like sailing regattas, um, agricultural fairs, um, gymkhanas, everything. They, they, they were part of the community. And that's something in Irish distillers uh, we try to really keep alive, that community involvement. And we have things called uh, Responsible Day, where every year we pick, we pick a, a charity for the year and you do various fundraisings. But you yeah. would go out and you would physically try and help them, whether that's painting a wall digging a garden, you know, planting a garden, doing something physically that can help, that gives back into the community. And um, 
because you you can't separate the entity of the distillery from the people and the community around them. Yeah, I mean that was really evident, you know, from some of the archives and some of the photos that you see of of the powers and, and Bow Street. Yeah, how yeah. how an integral part and how they gave back to to the local community. Um, and and give back without looking for anything, you know. It was no, it wasn't a photo opportunity, you yeah. know. It wasn't uh, to be on the front page of any paper. It was doing the right thing. It was yeah. actually just doing the right thing. Yeah. I want to bring up a, a few images of uh, some of the archives, Carol, and um, just maybe you could talk us a little bit about them. Um, sure. So let me just uh, make my way through these to see. Not as easy as it looks. <laughs> yeah, I I'm in awe of, of this. It's very easy for me oh, to turn up and technology. just turn on the laptop and you're driving everything. Yeah, oh. this this now is Middleton Distillery, what we call New Middleton, even though it's over 40 years old. And that's Old Middleton. So yeah. back in 1975, uh, you had the move from the, the Dublin distilleries. They would have looked, what you're looking at there is Old Middleton, which closed in 1975. Yeah. And that's where our brand home, the Jameson Distillery, Middleton is. And you can see it's settled in farmland. All yeah. around there is farmland. And that's what made it different to the two Dublin distilleries, to John's Lane and Bow Street. They were hemmed in by uh, roads, by the city. But yeah. down here, you actually had space to not convert the old, but to actually build the new. And they built in 1975 Europe's most advanced distillery. And yeah. it was built with the express vision of being able to produce the three different styles of whiskey that had been produced in Bow Street, in Johns Lane, and in Old Middleton. And it was it was and is a technological masterpiece. But you can see it there nestled in all those green fields. Now, yeah. um, today, uh, some a there's few been more a lot maturation. More <laughs> yeah. yeah, a few more a maturation, more maturation buildings. maturation huh? warehouses and also the, the new iconic garden still house. Um, yeah. But it's simply that they had the room to develop in Middleton, and that's why all production was, was transferred down to Middleton. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about the significance of that merger. And I, I know you played a huge role in that uh, podcast, A Story of Irish Whiskey. Oh, yeah. A fabulous production. But um, I'm just going to go through some of the. So this would be um, in John's Lane now. This is a, a scene. This is in John's Lane, building. and and for anybody who doesn't know, um, I'd love for them to guess where where the two gentlemen you see there are farming. Uh, powers were to me so innovative, so incredibly innovative, and th they always seem to think outside the box. You were asking earlier about. Uh, the Liberties and maybe the, the special atmosphere up there. And I think because the Liberties were outside Dublin city walls, maybe yeah. people weren't as rigorous about rules and thought a bit differently. So Powers um, had maturation warehouses on site in John's Lane, and they had a flat roof, and they covered that flat roof with earth to keep the insides of the warehouses cool and moist for the maturing whiskey. Now, this is years before uh, we'd understand green buildings or you'd be getting eco awards, they were doing this. And as you can see um, from that image there, they're doing this in the heart of Dublin city centre. And the houses that you see behind there are tenements. So you have families living in rooms. Maybe they might have two rooms, but they're living in one room. So a lot of the employees there, um, they didn't have access to gardens. And this image is from the 1940s, from the Second World War, the era known in Ireland as the emergency, where there was food rationing and the prices of foodstuffs uh, went through the roof. And the people, a lot of whom were from a farming background, they were from Wexford originally, now living in Dublin, saw this earth. And they went to the um, management of powers and said, well, can we farm it? And they said, why not? So what you're looking at here is men farming. They're actually growing potatoes and cabbage on top of the roof of a maturation warehouse in the center of Dublin city in the 1940s. Amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. And something oh. similar happened in Cork in our North Mal distillery. Again, the uh, same reasons, prices are skyrocketing for food and North Mal had a huge ornamental lawn. And what the company did is it plowed up the lawn and it parceled it out to all the employees as allotments. So again, city people living in the city centre would have land to grow their own food and vegetables on. 
I mean, it would be innovative to do that nowadays, even. We, I'd be, be expecting a reward for company of the year. But again, yeah. it was it was just the right thing to do. And, you know, it was about you know respecting the me. people. What strikes here. me about this photo as well, Carol, is uh, we touched on it earlier in our previous chat, um, how well dressed and how well presented the gentleman farming yeah. that yeah, field yeah. are. Um, that, was that the norm back then or were well, they always well dressed? The, there's enormous, um, from looking through the records of powers and from talking to people who worked in John's Lane, there was enormous sense of pride in, in working there. And uh, that's um, a shot there of uh, the stable staff and the uh, coachman from John's Lane. So you would have wanted to look your best, but also you wouldn't have had a huge wardrobe. You had your suit of clothes. And when people talk about a suit of clothes, that was it. You know, um, those were your clothes. And it wasn't that you went home and you slipped into something more comfortable. Those were your clothes. So if you worked somewhere like Powers, you can see at the front here, all these gents have been provided with a uniform. This this is a good perk because this right. is an extra suit of clothing that, that you're being given. Um, and they have turned themselves out. You're quite right. They've turned themselves out beautifully because there's great pride. Um, they were very proud to be associated with a product that was held in such high regard. Yeah. So they do put an effort into turning themselves out. Yeah. I mean, one thing, one thing uh, discussed and I've heard you talk about before when I've been lucky enough to, to go to some of your talks is how far ahead of the time powers in particular were. In Absolutely terms of, incredible. In terms of branding, in terms of quality, in terms of reach, and even equipment and, and everything else, they, they were really a groundbreaking company. Um, they, they absolutely were. And in, in terms of aesthetic vision, oh, yeah. this is, um, I, you know, this is another reason, uh, Serge, we could be raising a glass to powers. Of yeah. course, they were the first company in the world to bottle a miniature, the first yeah. spirits company. And uh, they produced the, the Baby Power, 1889, the first in the world to do that. And a lot of people ask me, well, why do they choose? Why? Why? You know, you're lying in bed one night and you suddenly go, oh, gosh, I should produce a miniature. Yeah. And I actually think um, it goes to the heart of Powers the Company and Powers the Brand. They were incredibly inclusive. And out of all the distilleries, um, and they were the ones who as managers or owners were closest to the employees. Yeah. They really uh, took it very, they took employing people very, very seriously and they had, would have had a very paternal um, feeling towards them. And they would have shown this in uh, the care they would have took in, they were the first, when Alfred Bernard, the famous whiskey journalist, when he visited all the distilleries, both in Britain and in Ireland in the 1880s, Powers was the only one that actually had a lunchroom, a dining hall for, for its employees where they could sit in comfort and eat. Yeah. And as I mentioned, uh, back in the 1880s, 1890s, Irish whiskey was a luxury drink. A bottle of Powers was very, very expensive. And it would not be within the remit of your ordinary working person to be able to buy a bottle on any sort of regular basis. It was something that really would be, you know, for weddings, funerals and the like. And yeah. that wouldn't have sat well with the Powers family because right. they were all about inclusion. And yeah. so it's my belief that they came up with the miniature to make it financially accessible to people who didn't earn a lot. Just because you weren't economically very well off, it didn't mean you shouldn't have the finest things. It shouldn't mean that you shouldn't be able to taste a very good whiskey. So I believe they produced a miniature for that reason. That uh, kind of brings me on to this picture here, which... I know is of the three swallows. Yeah, they were so far ahead of the time. Like, they were masters of marketing. In the one sense that they realized mm -hmm. that most people couldn't read at the well, time. This is true, and this is something now. Even though I, I big up powers on a regular basis, I can't I can't say that they're unique in this. This yeah. um, this was something that that was generally acknowledged, and for most bottles of whiskey and bottles of cognac, very similar, you needed yeah. an age statement. Uh, most of the whiskies at this time would have been seven years old um, or 10 years old, in fact. And there's no sense writing this is a lovely seven-year-old whiskey if people can't read that. You needed a visual signifier. Yeah. So Jameson um, had uh, three stars and would often, you know, you'd have somebody calling for a three-star Jameson, give me a seven-year-old Jameson. 
Yeah. But design and aesthetics was hugely important to Paris. So they came up with the emblem that you're showing there on the necklace on their bottles, the three swallow. And that's an age signifier saying it's seven years old, but why, why is it three swallows? So beautifully drawn. And I didn't know this. And I, I went on, I think, an interview with the Irish Times and pontificated about how nobody knows. I'd no sooner shut up than there was a phone call to our head office from a voice from somebody saying, well, I do know. And it was Olivia O'Reilly, uh, the daughter of Frank O'Reilly, the last managing director of Powers. And it was her father, a direct descendant of James Power, told her the story. And the Powers family, um, they lived a very gracious life and they would have traveled through Dublin by coach, by horse and coach. And they stabled their horses and their coaches in the, the um, distillery stables. And yeah. I think you had the photo there of the coachman and the groomsman. I have some of the horses. Yeah horses this is bow street but um when they would travel through the streets of dublin in their carriage or their coach each coach needed here we go that was them you needed three coachmen you needed a driver and his assistant and a third in the back to balance the coach when people were coming in and out and as yeah. they would drop the paris family to whatever glittering function they were going to they'd have to wait outside and if you work for a distiller the least you can hope for is a little flask of something to keep you warm but then as now, uh, you know, no drink driving your horses. And in this little flask, they would have enough for one good swallow for each man. So when it came to coming up with a visual age signifier, the Powers family gave a tribute to the coachman who would have driven them through the streets of Dublin by calling a three swallow after the three swallow nip that they would have. Yeah, amazing story. Uh, one of the things, that, the other things is that the reach that... Uh, Powers had uh, here we see the astonishing, tower absolutely in, in astonishing. Um, this, yeah, um, it did. We have record. I have a stock book from 1905, and it contains all little show cards. Um, this would be one of them. Yeah, advertising booklets, if you like, for Powers. And where they are is absolutely astonishing. 1905, they're selling in Cairo. There is no. If you're in Cairo and you need a glass of Irish whiskey, no problem whatsoever. They're selling in Uruguay. They're selling in Canada. They're selling in Australia. They're selling across Europe where you might expect. They're selling in Porto. You know, yeah. they're selling in Portugal. You, you wouldn't necessarily expect this. And they see themselves as the equal to any, any drink or any brand. And it gives them this confidence. And what you're looking there in that little image is the Powers Round Tower. And this is a display or an exhibit that they produced for the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. And the World's Fair were these 19th century phenomenon. And they would happen in a different country every couple of years and countries would compete to hold them. And literally millions of people would travel to these World's Fairs to see the latest technologies, the latest in research, in agriculture, in industry, in manufacturing. And so you wanted to be there and you wanted to be exhibiting. But there's no sense going to something like that and just having a table and saying, you know, drink my drink. So yeah. Powers came up with this exhibit that we're looking at here. And it's a life-size replica of an Irish round tower. That symbol that, of the Irish countryside of um, medieval monastic settlements that every Irish schoolchild is familiar with. And this is based on the O'Connell Monument in Glasnevin in Dublin. And it is a life-size replica. It's 10 meters high. They, I, calc I counted one day, there would be over 700 bottles um, on tiers going up. And you can see in that little illustration on the ground there, there's life-size human figures, some of them wearing top hats, and they only come up to the first tier. And you would have had the glittering gold labels, and you would have walked into that hall, and you literally, your eyes would grow huge, and you'd look at this, this shining tower going up to the sky, and you'd say, what is this? And they'd say, it's Powers Irish Whiskey. And I mean, that to me, the confidence of being able to do that. And they built that in-house. They built it using the craftsmen who worked in John's Lane. It's astonishing. It is. And the other thing that's astonishing is you were telling me that this is actually a, a two-inch card. Yeah. And that is, that is actually gold leaf used. That's right. Card. And these yeah. were used for, for little advertising. They, they would have been they? given out free to, um, to spirit merchants or shopkeepers. To sit yeah. on the counter and just as you'd go in, as you'd go into an off license today, and you, they were there to catch your eye. 
and um but but what they would signify when you look at the use of color now in this little card every time this was produced about 1905 every time you'd add a second color you double the cost of the printing so when you'd see this you'd know that whatever it's pointing to was going to be expensive but it was probably going to be worth the expense yeah i mean powers was a a, a very premium drink it was almost oh, double the price of, of jameson was it and uh, no no not double <laughs> not double <laughs> no it was more expensive um, uh, no, my, mildly more like Jameson. What was also a prestige drink, Irish Irish whiskey as a whole, and yeah. would have been considered a high end drink. Yeah, here we see the front of. Uh, That's the front of John's Lane. Lane, and if you walk down Thomas Street in Dublin, Dublin's Li Liberties, you'll still see that arch. That is the entrance nowadays to the NCAD, the National College of Art and Design. You can still walk through that arch, and I often do. I often do yeah. just just to go in, just to please myself really uh, here's more examples of powers branding and I, I think if i'm not mistaken carl there seems to be an awful lot more powers branding than there would of the other brands am i right they or... were more visually aware definitely that's definitely yeah. true and they put a huge emphasis on design in an era that you didn't necessarily do that and yeah. this was something that came through the archives very strongly, purposeful design. Um, and the diamond P was something that, that just jumped out for me. As I'd go through the, the correspondence, th they would never write Powers Distillery themselves in their own internal correspondence. They would just write the, the diamond P, P with the diamond around it. And yeah. this was the original brand from 1791, when James Power, the, uh, the innkeeper, started distilling literally at the back garden of his inn on John's Lane, uh, he, he would have sold by the cask and rolling out the cask, he would have branded the diamond P. You wouldn't have incorporated a name as we do now. It was the diamond P. And for powers, that was always their symbol for themselves was the diamond P. So as you know, there's, there's been a repackaging and a restaging of powers. And yeah. the first thing the brand team did is come to the archive and do a deep dive into the records and see well, what, what, what is true to the brand's DNA? How did powers view themselves? And what, what was the symbols that they used? And it was a no brainer. It was the diamond P. That's what yeah. came out and everything. And that's why it's highlighted so much now on, on the, the newer branding. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit maybe about, uh, because we've talked a lot about powers, maybe a little bit more about uh, Jameson itself and Bow Street some of the um, stories from there a, another incredible place like the distilleries are, are very much um, a world unto themselves i always refer to them as small towns you know within the cities of dublin and yeah. within those small towns you, you had your inhabitants and you'd have generations of inhabitants you know uh you'd be working there your father would be working there your grandfather would be working there it's absolutely astonishing and i i think there's no greater tribute to a place that you would like your children to work there yeah, it um, wasn't very you know, much a job for life, was it? Uh, and for the family as well. It, it was It was so much more than a job for life. Um, our old friend Alfred Bernard, again, when he visited Bow Lane in the 1880s, or Bow Street, sorry, um, he noted that there were a lot of what he called venerable graybeards working there. Because, yeah. again, this is a time where you there's no old age pension. So if you don't have a family, if you don't have children, and you cease work, you have no income. You know, you literally have no income. So what Jameson would do is if somebody was in that position and they didn't have a family to support them, they would give them a softer and a softer and a softer job till you'd end up sitting on a stool inside the gate, just, you know, waving at people as they came in and out because they wouldn't leave you go, you know. Um, now, they couldn't do that for everyone, obviously, but they right. did do it for a lot of employees and they would voluntarily themselves give pensions to widows and family members. Yeah, I mean, that was one thing that came out during the launch of the LBA uh, powers, how much they looked after their, their yeah. staff and the family of the staff as well. It wasn't just... Oh, yeah, absolutely. And you see that in the, the records in Middleton as well. You know, yeah. you'd get um, a letter in from a widow of, of a deceased member of staff, maybe several years down the line, you know, and things aren't going so well. And, you know, a check would be sent out. Again, not always and not making them out to be saints, but there was this great sense of, of duty of paying back, you know, yeah. that, that if somebody did well by you, 
you know, then you should do well by them and you should pay it back. Yeah. We're going on to this uh, a story of Irish whiskey and the podcast, the re- hugely successful podcast that you were involved in. It uh, was. It was uh, six parts, wasn't it? It was. And again, um, it, it's it's part of, of the ongoing innovation. Uh, that was my first podcast, Sergius. Yes. Yeah, um, and it, it's just about because people really want to know the story of Irish whiskey and the story behind their, their favorite brands. And Jameson, especially, it's it's the number one selling Irish whiskey, and people really want to know who makes it, yeah. and why why is it made now in Cork? You know, this was a Dublin brand, so that's what uh, this podcast, a story of Irish whiskey, it's the story of Irish distillers. How did the company come to be? Um, where did it come from? What made it necessary for the three giants of Irish whiskey? Um, Middleton, Powers, and Jameson to actually merge. So in in nice little sound bites. Um, so you get it wherever you get your good podcasts. <laughs> yeah, the story of our, uh, and yeah. I mean it, it's a very um, it's really brought to life as a podcast. You know, even with the sound effects in it and everything. It, it is, it, and it, again, um, it, it was all there. Our history yeah. was all there. You know, it was just a matter. Uh, we have a great um, communications team in Irish Distillers. Um, led by um, Aoife and Danielle, they're just absolutely amazing. Uh, Aoife Keane and Danielle Scully, and uh, they they brought the whole thing to life. And yeah, it's it's been lovely to be able to share that story because again, for me, you know, who would come to um, Irish distillers knowing nothing about the history of Irish whiskey, I was just so blown away by the incredible history and the pride and the passion, the innovation. Um, the standard of the whiskey that was produced and th- this absolute belief in quality that comes through the generations of, of whiskey distilling that it, it, for me as an Irish person, I felt very, very proud. So it was great to be able to share that story and for other Irish people um, to take part in that pride. I know one of the things, one of the things you do in your role, Carol, is, uh, and certainly more more over the latter years, I think, is you do speak, uh, you do go and um talk almost as a brand ambassador for some of these brands as well but um well i I tell you now what i found is i don't work for marketing i'm not in the marketing department no yeah but sometimes um i prefer to tell the story because i'm i'm very fact orientated and you know that's my background and if if you tell somebody something and they pass it on uh, sometimes you know so i prefer to at least be out there give give the version that i have seen through the records and um and I, I enjoy enjoy sharing that with people anyway yeah no it comes through and i mean it, it, to share a story firsthand is always so much richer i think but uh, i mean you tell the story so eloquently and so and with such even with even really... with the cork accent sergio well that can... makes it even more endearing i think but, <laughs> but what do you think it is people's fascination because well, it's know, a part of our history that, that we didn't know about and when you look back at the 19th century in particular <laughs> There's not yeah. an awful lot you can take huge pride in. Yeah. You know, there probably is. We just don't know about it. But, you know, as you're taught history, um, uh, you know, the, the fulcrum of the 19th century is, of course, the Great Famine. You know, that's not not a happy topic. Um, yeah. Then you have a lot of kind of um, civic unrest never ends well. You know, that's not another happy topic. Sure. Um, and so to have a story of Ireland reaching out with a product that was a world leader yeah. and it was was just so revered i think irish people really respond well to that and why wouldn't you you know why yeah. wouldn't you and i think it can give an awful lot of impetus and ambition for all the new entrants into the car- category to yeah. know that this is a product that had this incredible reputation and sure you know if you want to be part of it why not yeah but is there a sense then of responsibility presumably Dude huge yeah. and it comes through the records as well in that the adherence to quality um yeah. and when they would act together um they would act together to uphold that quality like the, there's a very famous book written in 1878 truths about whiskey yeah. and it's when all the irish distillers band together to publish this book because they had felt that the reputation of irish whiskey was under threat a lot of people think this book is condemning the coffee still it's not it's not about that at all it's condemning yeah. the practice of um t- 
distillers, not from Ireland, of brewing a spirit, mixing it with a tiny quantity of pot still, which is a signature Irish style, and calling it pot still so that a consumer is going to get a second rate whiskey and think it's Irish pot still. And that got the hackles up because um, the quality is everything. And once you lose your reputation for quality, it, it would be very hard to get it back. So that's the only time you ever see them acting negatively or defensively is when yeah. they feel quality has been compromised. Yeah, and, and obviously the, the quality is such an important part of, of maintaining Ireland's it's, resurgence it's, in the, in the whiskey is. sector. Yeah. It still is, and that's where you, you find the Irish Whiskey Association working so hard, you know, behind the scenes, uh, just keeping up that, that traditional quality. Do you miss the travel, being able to travel um, now, or is it nice to be spend some time at home? It, it's spending a lot of time at home. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was watching a film the other night with my husband, and uh, it was said, there was some scene, it was in an airport, and I started getting nostalgic you know, for the hard plastic, uncomfortable seat in the in oh, the lounge. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I think I think like anyone else, I'm, I'm feeling, you know, a, li a little bit stir crazy. But again, there's a bigger picture and yeah. there's a reason we're doing this. And I, I do hark back to almost 100 years ago when you had um, the, the Spanish flu epidemic. Yeah. And there's a very good Irish historian, Ida Milne, M-I-L-N-E. And if you want to Google, she's been giving a lot of seminars talking about that and parallels. And, you know, if they got through it, then we'll get through this now as well. Yeah. Tell me, I wanted to, to pick um, an unsung hero, if you like, from the archives that maybe we may not have heard about. There's, Is there anybody you can talk about? As, as, as you ask about that now, there's a collective groan from anybody who works in Middleton or Irish distillers, because they already know who I'm going to talk about. My hero, uh, he's a man called Mr. Norbert Murphy, and I feel he gets very short shrift. In, and I think he is a genuine colossus of Irish whiskey. Uh, but he, he's not been heard of because at the time, self-promotion wasn't a thing. You, you wouldn't have had any of the Jameson family, you know, on a, a talk show circuit. The yeah. same with the Murphys and the founders of Middleton, of whom Mr. Norbert um, was a descendant. They didn't promote themselves. They barely promoted their whiskey. You know, yeah. you won't find an awful lot of advertising. They believed if you had to advertise, you already failed, you know, okay. people should know. And if they didn't know, well, then that was their lookout. But yeah. Mr. Norbert, um, he became manager of the North Mal Distillery in Cork in about um, 1916. So in the middle of, of World War I, and he had an incredible 70 years working. And he became um, the de facto head of, of the Cork Distilleries Company. And he saw... The Cork Distilleries Company, of which Middleton Distillery was at the heart, he saw it through the First World War, through Prohibition. He then went into uh, the Anglo-Irish Trade War, the Second World War, the emergency period, 1950s, um, absolute recession and dreadful government um, restrictions of exports. He yeah. saw the company through all of that and he kept it afloat. And what he never lost was an innovative spirit. You know, and that is something that has stood to the company then. And it's something that we, we truly embrace now. And part of his innovation, he was the man uh, responsible for getting a, a bright young fellow called Max Crockett working on right. cork dry gin. And in 1941, in the middle of the emergency, when things were dire and there was no sale for the whiskey, they produced cork dry gin, the first commercially produced uh, gin in Ireland. So um, and he was incredibly innovative and well into his eight, late 70s, 80s, he comes up with the brand Hewitt's, which is still talked about so favorably well, yeah. today. Yeah, that was all him, all yeah. him. Yeah. And as, as apart from anything else, he kept the distillery alive through the merger and he became the first president of Irish distillers. It was towards the end of his life. And I like to think part of his spirit lives on in the micro distillery in Middleton, which is a hub now for innovation. Yeah. And that is part of the of of the long tradition, just because you already know you're very good at what you do. You know, I, Irish distillers would be the category leader. They, there's no sense sitting back. We do produce the, the, the most sold and the most drunk Irish whiskey, Jameson. Mm -hmm. But there's no point in just sitting back and, and saying, well, we can do that. Let's go fishing. Um, 
you have to always innovate. And that's where you see things like the Method of Madness range. And that's coming out of the micro distillery, but all the new entrants that are coming in um, through the graduate engineers program and yeah. through this new enthusiasm. And you see that in the old records, you see that in powers. We have some records of the distillers about 1910 doing night classes because they understand distillation, but they don't understand the chemistry behind it because people didn't know about it. So yeah. as soon as that knowledge becomes available, they're off embracing it. They could have sat back and said, well, we do produce the best selling whiskey, but they didn't. Yeah. And that's something that's what makes Irish whiskey really exciting, I think. And certainly yeah. for Irish distillers, it's what, it what, you know, makes it a wonderful place to work is yeah. there's that spirit of, of experimentation, both within distilling, but also within maturation. And that has been going on since the 1980s, you yeah. know, ex experimenting with different um, casks and barrels. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But you know, no, you enjoy you enjoy the process. To take the risk, yeah. And we had a great mm -hmm. chat with Kevin O'Gorman about ma maturation, and of course, now sure, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, fascinating. Is there is there one archive that you would pick out as being the most significant and interesting that you've found? Yeah, uh, you pick you, one. Um. I don't think I could because you can never take a document out of context. Yeah. You know, you might find a particular mash bill or recipe for a particular time and say, aha, but you have to know what was going through the mind of the, of the person who produced it. Yeah. Maybe he went to the local grain merchant and the grain he wanted wasn't there. So he actually compromised. Maybe this isn't what he wanted to be producing at all. Likewise, you see somebody selling in a, in a territory and you're going, I wonder why. And mm -hmm. if you dig back, you'll find that his daughter has just married somebody from that area. So that's why he's selling there. Okay, it isn't because yeah. he thinks it's a great market or anything like that. So it's the context, it's the collection. But if I had to pick um, one, one subset of the collection, it would be the wage books. Mm -hmm. And for Bow Street, we have an incredible hundred years of the wage books. And you just look at the names and you see them as human beings, you know, yeah. who turned up for work. This is the work they did. Uh, this is what they were paid. You can imagine the camaraderie. You, you, you can just imagine the lives because yeah. it is about the human hands. At the end of the day, it's human hands make it and it's human hands enjoy it. And it's so that for me, it's it's the people. It would, if, if the building was burning, I'd be trying to save the, the way. <laughs> yeah. In, in terms of the refurb of the Bow Street, uh, the visitor center there, you you had a huge role in in the display. Yeah, and because what, what was that that gave there? us an opportunity. Um, when Bow Street originally opened, uh, the archive was still very much inaccessible, so it mm. was refurbished a couple of years ago, and this gave the opportunity to actually tell some of our stories, our individual and unique stories, and the team up there just really embraced that. And even when you go in, you can go in to do um, a tour, but you can go in there for a drink as well. Yeah. Uh, well, you could <laughs> when Dublin wasn't in lockdown. Yeah. Yeah. But when you go in, um, and if you look at the bar area, and there's a lot of furniture, if you just look at the side of the furniture, there's actually the surnames, the most common surnames that crop up in the wage books are carved all the way around, yeah. uh, just as a homage to, you know, it might be the name Jameson on the bottle, but the, a lot of people were involved in the production. So uh -huh. um, th there's a wonderful sense of continuity in history when you go in there, as well as some very nice cocktails. Yeah, I think Ger Garland was telling me his name is there on the edge. It somewhere. is. So, it yeah. is. Yeah. 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 Uh, Eric was mentioning there the, the grain that you found in the notebook of Jameson, which is, uh, you know, famous story. Oh, yeah, story that, that, now, was, that, was a, that was another incredible moment. Um, this was a notebook belonging to John Jameson II yeah. uh, from 1826. When I first started going through the records, I thought, this John Jameson never dies. Like, this guy's immortal because he was yeah. popping up all over the place. But there was actually four. You know, a great grandfather, a grandfather, a father and a son, all yes. calling their elder sons John. So, you know, <laughs> that's why there was a lot of records relating to him. But this is John Jameson II, and he was a hands-on distiller. And this was his pocket notebook with his mash bills, the recipes for Jameson whiskey from 1826, which, as you can imagine, was like gold, like when we came across this. But it was very tattered. So uh, before I could even open it, I knew it needed to be conserved properly by a paper conservator. So I sent it down to Paul Curtis, who operates out of Muckras Bindery in Muckras House in Killarney. And he right. is an absolute expert 
uh, both a paper conservator and binder. You know, that's where I get all all my archival work done. And yeah. Paul took to repair it. He took it apart. And when he took it apart, grains of barley from 1826 that had been used in the distillation of Jameson fell out. Yeah. And uh, Paul knew enough to scoop them together and, you know, put them in a little envelope for me when I went down to collect it. And yeah. what a tangible link to your history, you know, that this this is what John Jameson touched. That's yeah. um, now we did. They were kind of atrophied. So we did send some to the Department of Agriculture because we were hoping to break it down. But they, yeah. they were too far dried to find out were what they? the variety was. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for anybody visiting the Bow Street Distillery, I mean, it's a fantastic. Uh, it's a wonderful place. History, really well presented, and done in a uh, done in a contemporary way as well. It's, yeah. Oh, yeah. Not, it is very much know, so. Yeah. So, so, where does what's the end game then, Carol, in terms of the archives? I presume there's enough there to be there for the next 20, 30 years. Um, I won't be the one who catalogues everything. Um, all I've really? done, and it's taken eight years, is just a very, very rough overview of what's there. Yeah. Um, the, the actual time to sit down and catalogue it to the standard it should be done, that's that's going to be my successor, I think. Yeah. yeah. Tell me, uh, obviously we have archives now, looking forward 100 years, if we can. What will... What will an archivist be looking at when they look through the records and maybe even look through the records that you put together? What will it be like for them in the future? They'll say what a tidy office she left. <laughs> <laughs> what a fantastic job you did. But of course, everything will be digital, I presume. At, at There'll point. be a, an awful lot of the records now, uh, the distillers' ledgers that I was talking about. They're all born digital records. They, they never see paper. They're not printed out. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and, and yes, you get the information. The information yeah. is the key thing. It's still there. But you don't have that tactile sense of yeah. this is what somebody wrote. You know, somebody dipped a quill in ink. They yeah. put pen to paper. Their hand touched it. They breathed on it. They looked at it. You know, the emotion, the emotive part of it, yeah. um, th that won't be there. But that's just the nature of the evolving world. And I'm sure people many, many, many years ago said the same about wax tablets, clay tablets, you know, oh, <laughs> when I the wonder. printing press arrived, they I gave out about that. But... You know, I, I think I mentioned to you earlier that, you know, I have some of the older ledgers and receipts even from Powers and from Jameson that were given to some of the publicans. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that struck me was was the quality of the writing and the presentation of, of something that nowadays is just so taken for granted. Uh, the the workmanship in them even from they they, they are beautiful they are works yeah. of art um but again that, that was a skill that you were trained at um yeah. if you're training for a clerk that is part of your training is to have that beautiful italic with looped but legible yeah. handwriting and that yeah. that's a gift to any archivist the, the sad reality is is that most people had bad handwriting and yeah. so you can spend an hour trying to literally read two two lines i know i know Carol, it's been fantastic having you on the show. I mean, I, I've listened to you so many times and it's been always been fascinating to listen to not only it's the a, story, but how you present it as well. You bring it to life, which I think is... Uh, thank you very much, Sergio. Which is a real, well, it's a real skill. And I, th I think from my point of view, anyway, the importance of the, of the work that you do is, is huge. And you do it, it is, so well. and I'd give, but, I'd give all credit to Irish distillers for um, we're the only whiskey company that has a full time archivist, yeah. and I would give all credit to them for investing not only in their future but um, investing in val in the valuing of their past. Yeah, no, it's been fantastic, and I'm looking forward to to listening to you again in person <laughs> at yeah, some I show on so. here, and I'm hoping it won't be too far. But well, Sergius, a... I'll raise a glass to that. A to, uh, to the future. And the thank future. you very much. Yeah. More thank than you welcome. very much. Bye Take now. Care. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye. Wow. Well, uh, that was just absolutely fascinating. Certainly for me, anyway, a real pleasure and an honor to to listen to Carol always, but to be able to ask her questions that I've been meaning to ask for so long and to share those with uh, our viewers. So Hopefully you enjoyed the show. Uh, it will be available for, for download and it'll be on YouTube. And uh, look, uh, I think we've been gone well over the time, but uh, a very, very enjoyable show. 
and uh, look forward to speaking to you hopefully next week we'll have another guest next week or actually i think we have guests next week so um thank you very much for joining and uh stay safe take care and slauncha thank you